Okay, so let's get started. This is the uh, Fischer Schulz lecture. Thanks everybody for sticking around until kind of that late into the conference. Yeah, please come in and take a seat. And we are very grateful, of course, for, for, for Whitney Newey, uh, to Whitney Newey for delivering this lecture. And we're also super grateful for Ivan Fernandez Wall for kind of uh, introducing Whitney and chairing the session. Thank you. Okay, so welcome everybody to the Fischer Schulz lecture. So it's truly a pleasure and an honor for me to introduce uh, Whitney Newey. So I have known uh, Whitney for many years since I was a graduate student uh, at MIT. So I think he doesn't need a lot of introductions, but I, I prepared some slides in case it's needed. So he did his bachelor degree in economics in Brigham John uh, University. He did his PhD at MIT under the supervision of Jerry Hausman. So he's currently the fourth professor uh, at MIT. So he has been elected fellow or member of the most presti uh, prestigious associations, including the American Economic Association, Econometrics Society, and the American Academy of, of Arts and Sciences, for example. He has also served uh, in several uh, positions in the Econometric uh, so uh, Society, he has been uh, co-editor of Econometric, of, the, uh, of Econometrica, and I think it's fair to say that he's one of the most uh, influential econometricians of the last uh, three decades, okay, and which is kind of remarkable is that his influence not only goes to the econometric theory, but also to the uh, empirical, uh, empirical uh, people. So I had some trouble okay, fitting the research areas in the slide. Okay, as I was adding areas, I mean, the font were getting smaller, so I had to stop at some point. But he has done uh, research in many different areas, including inference in linear regression models, asymptotic theories, semi-parametrics, non-parametrics, panel data, sample selection, GMN and related methods, many and weak instruments, non-parametric simultaneous uh, equation models. He has also done work in more structural econometric models. And more recently, he has been working on how uh, to use uh, machine learning tools okay, in econometrics, and in particular, uh, for causal inference. Okay, so he has been extremely uh, prolific. Okay, he has published more than 100 articles, okay, including in the articles in the most prestigious uh, journals in economics and statistics. So uh, his work has a huge impact. Okay, he has like almost uh, 67,000 uh, citations. And here I have included like a small sample of uh, articles. So uh, one is the uh, the article in Econometrica with Ken West, the, where they introduced the uh, Newey West standard errors, so that's his most uh, highly cited uh, article. So he also has a, a chapter in the Handbook of Econometrics, okay, which is uh, commonly used in most uh, programs okay, to teach uh, asymptotic theory. He also has a, a, an article in 1994 in Econometrica, which is kind of a foundational article for uh, semi-parametric uh, analysis. And also he has a very influential recent paper in the Econometrics uh, Journal, okay, which uh, shows uh, how, I mean, which is an example of how of the use of machine learning uh, in econometrics, okay, which also is getting uh, a lot of uh, attention. And the last thing that I want to say is that I can tell in my experience that he's an extremely uh, generous advisor and co-author. Okay, I have, and here just put a list of uh, advisees and uh, co-authors, okay, just uh, to make the case, okay, that he has like a broad network of both advisee uh, and co-authors. Okay, and that's kind of all that I'm going to say, and then I'm going to uh, leave the room for Whitney, who is going to talk about linear estimation of structural and causal effects for non-separable uh, panel models. So, Whitney. Thank you very much, Yvonne, for the introduction. I was very generous. <laughs> And uh, very happy to be here. Appreciate the invitation and opportunity to uh, 
to meet with you and talk about some uh, hopefully uh, useful things. So uh, this, uh, right, we're gonna, okay, so this is a, this is a, a talk about uh, non-separable models, and those of you who were here for uh, Rosa Matskin's presidential address will recognize the importance of this. And so uh, the paper does build on a, a NBR working paper from a few years ago. Uh, it, it supersedes that paper. It's called Demand Analysis with Many Prices. But actually, it's not really that paper. Uh, there's, uh, we've done a lot more and I'll, I'll talk briefly about that. The current paper is co-authored <laughs> with uh, uh, several people, uh, my colleague Victor and colleagues Victor and Jerry and, and uh, Ben Diener and Ying Gao, um, uh, both of whom are MIT students or former MIT students. Uh, models that are non-separable are really important in economics. Uh, they're fundamental, really, to thinking about economic modeling when there's unobserved heterogeneity. Um, they in particular the structure of not being additively separable and unobserved and observed things is really important actually. You often want to let uh, your the functions you're interested in to the, going to give you policy effects depend on heterogeneity in general ways and, and if you really want it to be general it's uh, very helpful if it's um, you know non-separable. Uh, the observed variables are typically quantities of interest. The unobserved variables represent preferences or technology. And a great example that uh, Rosa talked about is demand, where I'm gonna, we're going to specify that in terms of the share here. And consistent with uh, long history in demand analysis, and so we have a share function, share of expenditure on a particular good, which is a function of uh, prices of that good and of other goods, and uh, also of income Y. So those, the prices are the P, income is Y, and then you have etas, uh, possibly an infinite number of them, okay, uh, uh, to that represent the unobserved heterogeneity. So the observed things, prices and income, unobserved things are preferences, basically, that are uh, you think of them as uh, parameterized by an infinite dimensional vector, you can think of them as a, a, uh, a function. Um, okay, so that's the, that's this, uh, a good example uh, for, for many reasons. Uh, this, this typical approach or this kind of approach which you would often think about in applied work, you know, of a, estimating a share equation and has been done for a long time, you know, dating since Deaton and Mulbauer and, and uh, before that and since that, of course. Uh, it's, it's actually, if you have a single choice that you make and you're, you're not choosing, a, you know, you're not indifferent across a range of outcomes, it's really equivalent to the stochastic real, revealed preference models of McFadden and Richter, McFadden, Kittimer, and Stoya. Uh, and so it's a, it's a pretty general way of thinking about things. Normally in applied work, we think about demand just being a, 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 a single choice and not being a correspondence. So uh, non-separable models are also equivalent to treatment effect models. Uh, a to the eta's, can, you can think of those as potential outcomes there. Those are the unobserved things and then the the actual outcome is a function of those potential outcomes and of choices often uh, in those models. So, so in economic models with these non-separable models, it seems, to, it seems important to allow price effects, income effects, and other effects to vary over individuals in general ways. You know, if you were to plot, if I were to, we were to talk to everybody in this room about what the range of their price and income elasticities is, I don't think it would it would be unusual for it to lie along a curve. <laughs> you would generally find a pretty uh, general distribution of that across uh, that's not confined to a single dimension. And so it's useful to allow, and allow, you know, I think for applications for uh, these, these uh, very general relationship between 
the outcome and, and what's unobserved, the preferences. Okay, and so that motivates interest in models that are not additively separable and have general multidimensional heterogeneity. So that's kind of the starting point for this. That's not where we're going to end up, actually, but that's the starting point. Okay, so now an important problem, uh, you know, all the time in economics is endogeneity. You know, there's, there's correlation between these observed variable, variables that you care about and the unobserved ones, the preferences, technology. Uh, they may be choice variables, right? Uh, uh, certainly in a lot of cases, um, they would be choice variables. In a demand function, you've got prices in there, and that's deter they're determined in a market, and they might well be related to preferences of an individual, okay? And, uh, and same with other settings, right? Panel data, and the role of panel data here is it can help control for that endogeneity, okay? And so, in particular, it can be used to identify and estimate counterfactual effects when observables and unobservables are correlated. So you can get at the thing that you want, the effect of changing some observed variable, like prices, on the outcome uh, <coughs> when, when the prices and the, out and the unobservables, the preferences, are correlated. And we know this from linear models, right? We know this from linear models. It's also true in nonlinear, non-separable models. And the, the, a key assumption that allows you to do that is, is this, uh, I'm going to just call it time stationarity. I'm going to come back and talk about relaxing the stationarity, but just now think of it as time stationarity. Okay, and that assumption is that the conditional distribution of unobserved heterogeneity, right? Unobserved heterogeneity in each time period, conditional on regressors in all time periods does not, does, sorry, does not depend on a time period. First typo, not the last, but this one I didn't find yet. So it uh, does not depend on a time period. We'll come back to this. And so uh, that's actually the basis of, um, linear models as well, as I'll mention in just a second, but it became prominent with uh, Mansky's uh, maximum score estimator of a binary choice model with an individual effect in it. Okay, and he used that assumption. Then Honoré used it, and Pesserin and Smith, Abravaya, uh, we've, we've looked at it in some work, and Graham and Powell, uh, Pecos and Porter, Shi, Shum, and Song, and so it's, it's kind of the a, a one fundamental approach to think about identification of effects of interest in a panel when you have a non-separable model. Okay, so that's why it's um, so important. Non-separable models are important. And, and, and this kind of assumption can help you to identify effects you're interested in, the effect of observables on outcomes. Um, Center is paribus or holding constant, you know, the, the unobservables. Okay, so it's, it's actually equivalent in a linear model to the usual model with a fixed effect, where the x's are uncorrelated, all leads and lags with the uh, idiosyncratic error. The standard linear model that we know and love, uh, you know, where you just uh, do fixed effects or you difference and then, and then use. Um, leads and lags as instrument. So with strict exogeneity, it's actually equivalent to an additive fixed effect, okay? Uh, when you do it in terms of linear projections, when you, instead of you replace the conditional distribution with the linear projection, it's equivalent. In non-separable models, there is another approach people have, have adopted that's, that's good and useful, it's, but it's different. Uh, and that's the correlated random effects assumptions. Chamberlain uh, talked about that in binary choice, and Wildridge has done uh, a lot with this. I'll, there's a nice paper of non, about non-separable models with Altanji and Matskin, and then Erlon and Bonholm have a paper as well. So uh, there's lots of work done with that. We're going to focus on the um, time stationarity condition. Okay. Uh, now, where does that come from? What's going on? You know, what are you assuming? You're assuming that the distribution of preferences and technology is, is, you know, has some 
not some. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it has stationarity over time. Conditional on the axis, okay? And, and because it, you're conditioning on the axis, the distribution of the axis can be correlated with the, the unobservables. You know, you're conditioning on prices and income. You have this time stationarity. Uh, but the fundamental, okay, and so it does allow for correlation, right, between uh, the observables and the unobservables. But then what you do is you uh, are use the time stationarity to identify things. Now, you know, it doesn't take much thought <laughs> to realize why that's important. Just think about what we do with panel data. We look at how X changing, right? We're going to look at how X changes uh, over time, how that affects Y. And if you want to get from that the effect of X on the current outcome, you need those changes in X over time to not be related with, to the unobservables. And that's what the, that's what the time stationarity does for you, okay? Okay, so now what we're gonna do, so we started with a non-separable model. It's gonna turn out that uh, you can estimate um, effects you're interested in with just linear regression methods, even in a non-separable model. Okay, and the idea is, is what we're going to do is we're going to approximate a smooth, and I'll come back and talk about this more, a smooth non-separable model by a linear model with coefficients that depend only on the heterogeneity and so inherit the time stationarity property, okay? And what that's going to give us is uh, once we do, do that approximation, the coefficients will be, have time stationary distributions <laughs> And so when you look at, the, look at them, what you're going to be able to do is for each individual, you're going to have, each individual is going to have the same coefficient in every time period, and that's going to allow you to estimate that coefficient for the individual. So um, this is a, and I'll come back and talk about this approximation in, in a few minutes here, but that's kind of the, where we're going is to, uh, approximate a non-separable model by a linear model with coefficients that depend only on the heterogeneity and so inherit the time stationarity property. And then, um, and then what we're going to do is we're just going to do what we said. We're going to take the individuals, we're going to estimate the coefficients from uh, observing the individual outcome, some individual's outcome over time, and estimate those coefficients. And then that's going to give us an approximation to uh, the general non-separable function, okay? Uh, and so what we do is actually, there is an issue with this, and uh, there's an important identification issue, which is, uh, you know, things are gonna be identified from changes over time, so people that don't have changes over time, uh, you're not gonna identify their, the effect for those individuals, okay? And so we have to do something about uh, those and what we're going to do is we're going to regularize. We're going to estimate each individual's coefficients by individual ridge regression uh, to regularize for possible singularity, and that's the non-identification. Possible singularity of the second moment matrix of the regressors, or near singularity of the second moment matrix of the in, uh, of the regressors. Okay, and then what we do is we estimate average effects by debiasing the average linear combination of individual ridge coefficients, debiasing for the ridge. Okay, the ridge regularization is going to introduce some bias, and then we're going to take the average of effects uh, across individuals, and we're going to debias that average. Um, okay, so that's what uh, we're going to do in the paper. Turns out this has some nice interpretations and some nice properties. Turns out the debiased average ridge estimator is an empirical Bayes estimator with a common prior mean where the regularization is controls or it represents the, the uh, dispersion that you have in the prior. Um, this this uh, debiased ridge estimator varies between linear fixed effects for lambda very large to uh, individual specific least squares effects as the ridge regularization parameter varies between uh, zero and infinity. So that's nice. On one side, you can just run it with a big lambda and you can see what the fixed effects would be. By fixed effects, what I mean is, a, is that the slopes are all the same for every individual, okay? 
Um, its conditional expectation is the true conditional effect if the coefficients do not vary over individuals. Okay, so we're going to debias in such a way so that if, if fixed effects is right, so that in fact the coefficients don't vary over individuals, you get unbiasedness. Okay, so um, that's a nice feature of this. And in general, though, its expectation is a weighted average of individual effects, and they have matrix weights, which complicates things. Um, and it vary by the strength of identification of the individual effect. So, so that's what we're going to talk about, that estimator and its use, and give a couple of empirical examples of that. Um, now, this is motivated by an approximation where the number of time periods grows with the number of individuals. Um, as, when that happens, in other words, when you can think of the number of time periods as relatively large, uh, rel relative to the number of individuals, uh, what happens is the identified set shrinks fast, okay? So just uh, implicitly here, as we said, you know, if there's, if you got some discrete regressor, and that's the one you're interested in, then, you know, for observations where there's no variation in it, you're, you know, you can't identify the effect for those individuals, okay? But what happens is that under, you know, some, uh, certain kinds of conditions that, you know, things do switch eventually back and forth, uh, that identification disappears as T gets, uh, that lack of identification disappears as T gets big. And so um, it turns out there's a certain rate at which that does, and that rate can be quite fast, depending on the particulars of the problem. And we'll get to that in just a second. Okay, and so the, um, as a number of regressors as the T grows, the identified set shrink, can shrink quickly uh, as T grows. And also, as the number of regressors grows with T, the approximation error from a linear regression for each individual can also sh uh, shrink quickly. And with those two things happening, uh, you, you know, you've turned a non-separable, partially identified model into a linear regression or many linear regressions, okay, and, and made it uh, easier to do in practice. And uh, Okay, so that's the goal. I thought about <laughs> we, of Ann and I and others, have worked on the partial identification problem and, you know, know that it's, you know, the set shrinks fast, that's great. But actually, <laughs> actually computing it in practice uh, is a little harder, and so we're happy to just skip through that <laughs> and just go straight for a linear regression. I'm happy. Sorry, I don't know if Yvonne's happy. <laughs> about it, but we're, we're happy, and so uh, we bypass the need for identification and inference under partial identification by doing this. Now, it's important in practice to know whether this is a problem, though. You know, you have, you don't, you have a particular, this is all, asymptotics is all just an approximation. <laughs> so you have a particular T in your application, and so you want to know whether this asymptotics apply, so we're going to provide ways of checking the extent of partial identification in practice to help determine whether the large T theory is working for you, okay? And what we provide in this, in this uh, version today is just quantile plots of the ratio of the size of regularized and true linear combinations, okay? So how am I doing on time? Well, let me get my Okay, so we have three examples of this in the paper. One is estimating average exact surplus and deadweight loss for uh, consumer demand. There's an empirical example of scanner data. Uh, another is estimating the effect of changing taxes on taxable income, uh, you know, when you have nonlinear budget sets, uh, okay, including an empirical example. And then we can look at estimating treatment on the policy effect and policy effects from panel data. We also just look briefly at that. So both of these, you have endogeneity troubles, right? Um, and that the panel can help you with. This one, the demand one, right? Even when you have um, a large market, uh, there's a potential endogeneity problem. And what happens here in the demand setting is that the panel data solves that problem. As long as you have something out there that's not 
consumer preferences is shifting the prices. As long as there's something that's shifting the prices, that solves that problem. Uh, we work that out. And uh, here, in the U.S. at least, you know, the budget set's endogenous, right? Um, like a, one major source of that is the fact that, you know, you can, well, at least you used to be able to de de deduct the interest on houses, right, when you own a house. And that, that makes, uh, you know, the, what you have endogeneity with the choice of housing in the budget set. Okay, and, and using these panel methods can control for that endogeneity. And so uh, we'll show a little bit how that works and what you get. At the same time, while you allow for completely general heterogeneity, uh, it's only recently that people have tried to do that in the taxable income literature, only very recently. And so one of the things you can allow is a completely uh, flexible heterogeneity and uh, preferences. Okay, so we'll talk about that too. Right, we, I just said this, uh, that controls for, panel data controls for endogeneity and demand. Uh, the methods allow for zero demand by simply including the observations at zero expenditure share. Uh, for expenditure share outcomes, uh, the shrinkage, just so you know, and uh, just say this once, the, let's do expenditure share, the sort of a classic uh, specification, right, is a regress expenditure share on log price and log income. And what the shrinkage is doing there is it uh, shrinks the individual ridge estimates towards a price elasticity of minus one, cost price elasticities of zero and expenditure elasticity of one. So that's good to know and sounds like a reasonable kind of shrinkage to do if you're going to do that. Uh, and, then, um, and then we estimate the average variation in dead weight loss taxes for, uh, on milk and soda. Okay. We also look at the, so one of the characteristics of this um, time stationarity condition is there are changes in the unobservables over time. So if you think about demand, uh, a non-separable demand model where the A does represent preferences, so built into this is uh, preferences shifting over time. Okay, so interesting thing to do is just look and see <laughs> whether preferences held constant over time work, and, and they don't, <laughs> right? So find that the axiom, in, at least in the data application we look at, the axiom, weak axiom of revealed preference is rejected for 95% of the individuals, uh, 60 time periods. Uh, well, most individuals are estimated to have uh, negative own price elasticities when time stationary preferences are allowed. Uh, the other thing to say about this, I want to say about this, is this, this uh, kind of variance preparation, uh, sorry, <laughs> preference variation over time is we do that all the time when we write down a binary choice model in panel data, right? Underneath, underneath there, there's some epsilons, some idiosyncratic shocks that are changing over time. And if that's the preferences, you have uh, preferences changing over time, okay? So it's just a, a kind of an extension of that to, uh, you know, continuous demand. Um, you give asymptotic theory for continuous regressors in a linear, mo linear model where with number of regressors much less than T and the asymptotic theory for the binary regressor is also given and we're working on the general discrete case. Uh, okay, but for a binary regressor, this works under, you need certain conditions, you need the identified set to shrink at a, sh a certain rate and it turns out when you do the asymptotic theory to get uh, root inconsistency and asymptotic normality with a binary regressor, the conditions imply that the identified set shrinks at the right rate. Okay. So uh, we're working on general results that combine, combine continuous and discrete regressors. Paper's different from the one that I mentioned, that NBR working paper. That didn't have anything about a gen approximating a general non-separable model. Um, the estimation here is about effects rather than just average coefficients. The asymptotic theory is different too, allows for approximation of a general non-separable model and non-identification with fixed T, and then we're providing measures of the extent of identification for applications. Okay, so here's, uh, here's uh, more notation, you know, typical panel data notation, individuals are I equal one to N, time periods T equals one to T, 
outcome variable is SIT and the right-hand side variables are XIT. And then the outcome is an unknown function of XIT and uh, individual heterogeneity. So that's the outcome. This is like the left-hand side variables, the right-hand side observed variables, and the uh, preferences or technology. Okay. Um, all right. And this uh, function is unknown. Okay. So this is non-separable, obviously, and allowing for general functional interactions between the observed variables and the arms of heterogeneity. Okay, and you can use time stationarity of the eight ITs to identify and estimate effects of changing XIT on SIT. Okay, so think of, think of this as the data, and then think of XI. So XI just lists the Xs for all observations. Little XI is just a possible realization of XI. And then the time stationary condition is that the distribution of A to IT conditioned on XI does not depend on T. Okay, so that's this time stationary condition that uh, we were talking about. So that's, that's the model, that's that assumption again. Now what about time effects? Well, they're allowed, right, if you think of time as one of these, uh, part of those regressors. Now you can't actually put in time, right, <laughs> because that's too general. You lose all uh, hope of identification, but you can think of putting time in in other ways and various semi-parametric specifications that involve time. Um, in the taxable income example, there's a time trend which represents uh, productivity growth that's individual specific, and we have that, but uh, we have not worked out yet the whole uh, way to think about this with time, to marry this with time effects. There's also some work in the uh, Graham and Powell paper, and then on our paper earlier on that. Okay, so the parameters of interest we're going to look at are averages of this over, okay, so this is the outcome function with a different x than the observed, right? So this is the outcome function with a different x than is actually observed. So we're going to think of parameters that are averages of this over x's and eta's when the x's are not equal to the uh, observed XIT, okay? So uh, as we all, you know, <laughs> pretty much are aware of at this point, right? That, that's a counterfactual, right? Uh, right? That's uh, XIT, if it's not the one that's observed, that's counterfactual, right? And so in the language of counterfactual, let's just think of an S outcome at uh, some XIT plus that's a potential outcome at XIT equals XIT plus, and XIT minus, um, uh, again, that's a potential outcome at little XIT, XIT minus, and an average effect of changing the Xs between those two values would be this. You just take theta naught, just average, of, we're going to do averages over T, weighted averages over T, if you want, of this object, okay? So that's one example of the kind of thing that you can hope to identify and estimate using panel data with the time stationary condition. So this one, this is the average equivalent variation in deadweight loss, and we do bounds uh, based on bounds on the income effect. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> okay, so important objects of interest are estimating the welfare effect of taxes, and then there's some notation for that. Okay, so it's just a formula, I'll just skip down. Okay, so it's a formula that looks a lot like the other one, okay, where you just, this particular function captures the, uh, captures the surplus. It's basically an integral over this, these uniform random variables. That takes care of the integration that you would do to calculate the equivalent variation, okay? In the case of heterogeneous taxable income, what we work with is a budget set regression that uh, uh, we've worked together on, Blomquist, Kumar, and Nui. Okay, and uh, what that does is specify the outcome, which I think of a log of taxable income here is the outcome, as a function of the budget set. And under some particular parametric assumptions, um, you get a very simple specification uh, of this form. This one's not non-parametric. It's uh, semi-parametric, as it were, but it's uh, just a simple linear specification where 
Beta 2 is the taxable income elasticity for individual I. So that's the first thing to mention here is the taxable income elasticity is going to be allowed to vary over individuals in a completely general way. Uh, this, this X, uh, this, the re corresponding regressor is the log of the slope of the last budget segment. X, the, the next variable is the difference of the log of the slope of the first and last segment. And then the, the last one is a time trend. Okay. So uh, that's going to be the uh, te heterogeneous taxable income elasticity example. Okay. And then what is it? Well, it's just, it's linear in the beta, so it's just, you know, you think about taking the uh, difference of the functions where you just uh, increment the XIT by one, okay? The corresponding XIT, which is the second one. Okay, so a general form that we're gonna look at, which includes all these things as special cases, is we'll just take the expectation of the time average of something times a uh, something a weight, as it were, times a counterfactual outcome for the, um, you know, for the one counterfactual outcome minus, uh, plus, sorry, an, uh, another weight times another counterfactual outcome. Example one is a special case of this kind, you know, the H is one and then minus one, uh, the two H's are. Example two is more complicated, example three is quite simple. Okay, and so this is just a, I'm just going to use this to look at what the linear approximation does, okay, and how you go from this linear approximation to get the effect you're interested in, and uh, it's quite simple, and we'll look at that in just a second. Okay, so the estimation that's based on this linear approximation, we're going to, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to bypass identification of theta naught for now. We're just going to push it into the background. It's important. We'll come back to it. But the thing that allows us to do that is we've already made this time stationarity assumption. That's like an exclusion restriction, right? It's like you're excluding from each time period things from other time periods involving the unobservables. Okay, so you've got this exclusion restriction. And we know that exclusion restrictions are sufficient when rank conditions are satisfied. We also know the rank conditions you can tell from the data, right, whether they're satisfied. So we're, gonna, we're just going to push identification into the background for now and then come back to it. Uh, okay, and then we'll also focus on large T inference where the identified sets are small, uh, enough that partial identification can be ignored. <laughs> Okay, and then talk about how to, importantly, we provide ways of checking the extent of identification in practice to help determine whether the large T theory is a good approximation, okay? So uh, the estimation is based on approximating this unknown non-separable separable function by a linear combination of known functions of XIT, okay? Okay, and we're going to assume throughout that the first function is a constant, just for convenience, it'll be the first one. The linear combination coefficients are unknown functions that can depend on parametrically on eta, and the approximation is simply this. We just replace this function of xt and eta t with uh, these function, these known functions of xt times something that depends on eta. Now, why does that work? Uh, the reason it works is that is, uh, it relies on a smoothness argument for x, uh, sorry, for the outcome as a function of x for all eta's, okay, and uniformly in eta. So the idea is that for xt bounded and s smooth enough function of xt, various approximation theorems, uh, in the, some of the approximation are these, you know, these are known as Jackson theorems, uh, imply that there are functions b of x, i, b of x, i, b of xt, not depending on eta, eta t, example are power series for Jackson theorems, and associated coefficients where the approximation error is small uniformly in X and eta. And that's a pretty strong condition. You don't actually need that, we don't think, but that's what we're working for, with at the moment. Uh, small uniformly in X and eta. Okay? Uh, so, so that's the idea. You know, for each eta, that's a different function. Right? Each eta gives you a different function here of X. Each eta different eta, different function, okay? And so the idea is, you know, like think of a power series approximation. 
uh, Jackson theorems, Jackson theorems say that uh, there are power series approximation where the error is small uniformly across a class of functions. And so as long as eta is such that you're uniformly in that class, then, then uh, you're fine, okay? This approximation works uniformly in X and eta. Now that's probably too strong for applications and, and I expect it can be weakened, but we're just, uh, we'll, we'll do that a little later. Okay, and we did, there is an approximation like this in uh, this paper with uh, Hausman on demand functions on, on actually uh, estimating uh, surplus bounds with, um, with general heterogeneity. Okay, so that's the approximation. Under, okay, and so here's how this works. Why does that help? Okay, or what, what does that do for you? Well, um, because it has this form that there's a function of x and a function of eta, that this de it decomposes into a product of those two things. Um, under time stationarity, right? Okay, so first of all, under time stationarity, the betas are time stationary. They're functions of only eta. So they're time stationary. So for any x tilde, okay, and so this introduces a restriction we're going to impose throughout. The x tildes, the counterfactuals we're look at, looking at, are going to be only functions of x. Okay, but it can be functions of x in all time periods, going to, but they're going to only be functions of x. Okay, so you think about uh, putting in some x tilde here, which is a function of the whole vector of x's, observed x's. I'll come back to that in a minute. Okay, and then when you look at this thing, you might be interested, a counter, a, you know, a counter, expected value of counterfactual outcomes, right? It's, you just put in this approximation, so, you know, approximately equal to this, that's true, under, you know, appropriate regularity conditions. Okay, and now this depends on X, and so you're gonna look at, when we looked at the regression, expectation of the share, conditional on all the X's in all time periods, you have this B here, uh, which is a function of x, it comes outside the conditional expectation, and then you have this expectation of beta, eta i t times, you know, condition on x i, and time stationarity kicks in, and you get just a beta bar, which doesn't depend on t, okay? So, time stationarity says that these coefficients, these regression coefficients that you get here in this approximation are the same for every time period, and so you can estimate them. Right? That's the exclusion restriction that allows you to es estimate these coefficients, okay? One way to think about it. And that, anyway, yeah, one way to think about it. So, um, okay, so that's, you, you got this linear approximation, you got the B, the functions you're using, whatever they are, and then you have coefficients which uh, are unknown and depend on Xi, and we'll call those beta bar of Xi. Time, time stationarity implies those de depend on T, uh, same coefficients appear in the approximation for each time period, okay? And now let's look at the parameter of interest and see then how you'd approximate that, okay? So that's, that's nice. That gives you a way, to, uh, gives you a right natural way to estimate B. It's just linear regression individual by individual, okay? Corresponding approximation for the parameters of interest. Look at this counterfactual, put in the approximation here, right? And you get this, and what do you get? You just get the approximating functions evaluated at the one out counterfactual outcome minus the ones at the other one times the beta bar, okay? So the way you would estimate this counterfactual is you just evaluate the approximating functions at these two value of x's and uh, multiply times your estimated coefficient and that's gonna give you an estimate of that. And that holds in general for this whole class of things, okay? Uh, this whole class of things that we're looking at. Where's Here's what you, what you get in general, the, the approximation to the expected value of those counterfactual differences of the non-separable outcomes is simply these weights times the approximating functions evaluated at the two potential, uh, the two counterfactual uh, values of x's, okay? Okay, and then, you know, what it, what it, note that this is observable, okay? So this is observable, this you get from the data. You pick the H's, you pick the approximating function, and then this, you get these, these, uh, these, this comes from the data, 
and then you're going to estimate the beta bar, and then since it's an expectation over observations, uh, all ob individuals, uh, the AI times the beta bar, you just take the sample average of that. Okay, so that's the estimator, very simple. Um, of course, the complication is that, uh, that um, you know, is the identification issue. Okay, so I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. So I just wanted to note that smoothness of the outcome function is not required for this. Um, it looks like it is, but it's actually not. In a binary choice model, you don't have that, right? The choice is an indicator function for whether some utility is, uh, you know, one outcome is better than a utility of another outcome. Well, you, you can get around it if you have, so there is an assumption you need, and the assumption that works is if there's some idiosyncratic error that has a nice and, nice and smooth CDF, <laughs> you can integrate it out, and you still get then something where S, the outcome SIT is some smooth function of XIT and some subvector of this plus a mean zero error term. Okay, so just you know you're just replacing basically uh, the the original outcome here with its conditional expectation conditioned on some etas. And there's another typo down here. This is a formula how to do that, but I'm missing a missing an eta here. That should be conditional on eta. Okay, so it sounds like smoothness, that's really restrictive, but it's not as restrictive as you might think because you can do this uh, trick. All you need is that up to the a mean zero error, mean zero conditioned on the, all the x's, uh, you have smoothness, okay? Okay, so again, there's our parameter of interest. There's the, there is the, uh, uh, there's the AI, just the, how you get it, depending on what uh, you're interested in. And then uh, we estimate theta naught by just replacing um, the expectation by a sample average and plugging an estimator of beta bar. Okay, and then uh, the approximation that helps us do that uh, is going to be the least squares one, and so we're just going to look at that. So the expectation of SIT given XI that's all the x's in all time periods is approximately right this. That's our approximation we used, and so it's just uh, you get a linear regression, right, where the, the regressors are just these approximating functions, okay? So you could try that. You could try doing least squares individual by individual to get your est estimate of each beta bar xi, but, you know, you, you can have some identification issues with that, and there could be high multicollinearity for... Uh, even in the continuous regressor case. So we regularize using ridge regression, okay? So this is just a, a describes next, just describe the ridge regression. So QI is the second moment matrix of the regressors divided by T. DI is gonna be the penalization matrix, the regularization matrix. And notice we're excluding the constant from this. We're not gonna regularize the constant. So this is, you're gonna take, you know, this is gonna be equivalent to taking deviations from uh, time means and then regularizing. And here's the ridge regression estimator that we're gonna look at, okay? We also now debias this to mitigate the shrinkage bias from the ridge, okay? So the way we do this for effects is the following, and this is designed to have a bias property, which I'll get to in just a second. But AI denote a square t-dimensional matrix with um, its first row is the AI prime, the transpose of the AI, and then you can just pick the identity matrix for the rest of it, uh, the first column being, the rest of the first column being zero, and pick the identity matrix for the rest of it. Okay, and that gives you an AI. And uh, having this AI, it's helpful. It, it's a kind of a matrix shift that allows you to get this unbiased property that we're going for, okay? And then the estimator of theta naught we're gonna look at is A bar, the average of the A's, times the average of the AI's times a, this WI matrix, okay? So this is kind of a, the effect of regularization on the coefficients, essentially. I'll come back to that. And then you have, uh, uh, this is just gonna be our estimator. You take the average of AI, times the ridge estimates, okay? You take the average of AI times this WI, 
and out front you put the average of the A's, and uh, this is going to be the estimator that we look at. Okay. Estimator for the asymptotic variance is really simple, right? Just apply the delta method, here it is. Okay, so that's, this accounts for the averaging here, the averaging there, and the averaging there, in the usual way for uh, these kinds of formulas, okay? Now, some parameters uh, of interest could, could be the betas themselves. That was true in the, in the taxable income example. And there, you can just think of AI as unit vectors and stack those into a big AI matrix. AI becomes the identity, right? And then uh, this is what you get when you have that, okay? So this is the de-bias estimator for the average of the coefficient, along with the standard error. Okay, these have some nice properties. This de-biased estimator has some nice properties. The de-biased average slope is an empirical Bayes estimator of a common prior mean for the betas, okay? For a Gaussian likelihood and prior and Gaussian uh, prior with variance one over lambda. Okay, so that's the, that's what it is. And it has that nice interpretation. You can also think of it as the limit of an iterative procedure where what you do is you, you do a Bayes estimation and you update your prior each time by making the next prior you, you're, you're going to look at be one where the, the uh, beta i, the, the centering for the prior, is at the previous de-biased estimate. Okay. So, I'm sorry, the previous, just the previous uh, average of the ridge estimates, sorry. Okay, uh, part, so that's one property. It, ha it has this uh, empirical Bayes interpretation. Another property is uh, lambda goes to infinity, the coefficients in beta hat of the non-constant variables, they're just converged to the fixed effects estimator. So as lambda runs between zero and infinity, you run between allowing for uh, beta to vary very generally to, to uh, to the fixed effects estimator, and that's result is completely consistent with one over lambda being the variance of the prior distribution of the slope coefficients, right? So if the prior is really concentrated, in other words, lambda is big, what, that's, what that says is that, you know, your Bayes estimator will tend to have a constant uh, uh, beta, and so that shows up here. As the prior variance shrinks, the common prior for the slopes dominate the Bayes estimator, right? Okay, so it has, also has some basic bias mitigation properties. As I said, if beta bar <coughs> of x is constant, it does not vary with uh, th that, then, the x, then it's unbiased, actually. This estimator is unbiased, um, conditionally unbiased. And the second is a basic property you would want anything to have. If qi is non-singular for every observation, then as the regularization goes away, you get the average. Um, actually, this becomes unbiased in the limit as the regularization goes away. And so that's a minimal property for regularization method. Now, it's important to understand how this behaves, though, when you don't have either of those conditions. Suppose the beta is very over-individual and, um, and you, you, know, you, you, uh, you have some, non some singularity out there. You, know, you have some non-identification for some individuals. Uh, it's important to understand that. Non-singularity of QI is the rank condition now, right? That is the rank condition for identification of beta for each individual. It's non-singularity of QI, right? So when it's singular, what happens is uh, you, you, your, your linear combination is probably not identified, right? When it's singular, it means that uh, this thing is not identified, and the linear combination is not identified either, except in the uh, except in the case that, you know, alpha I, A I is orthogonal to the null space of Q I, right? Uh, nonetheless, beta bar still estimates an identified object that may be of interest, and uh, we can look at that, okay? So here's a simple example. Suppose you just have two regressors, a constant and, and uh, uh, an X. Uh, look at what the average ridge estimator is in that case. And what you get is it's just a weighted average of the, of the, uh, uh, sorry, in expectation, 
it's a weighted, the expectation of this is a weighted average of the slopes, okay, over all individuals where these are the weights. In particular, when QI, QI tilde here is the variance of the x's over time, sorry, the variance of x2 over time, so when that doesn't vary, you don't have identification, and it gets zero weight. So it zeroes out things when it's not identified. In other cases, uh, you know, when it is identified just a little, you'll have less weight for that observation, okay? So that's what it does. Um, okay, it's a weighted average where you give more weight to the more strongly identified observations. In general, if you can, you can look at what the expectation is of the, of the object you're interested in. And what it is is this, okay, it's, um, it's this linear combination of the true betas where you know the linear combination coefficients, okay? So there they are. These are the linear combination coefficients that you get after regularization, okay? So they have a known form. You can compute them, uh, and yet they can also be shown to be a projection of a transformation of the true ones on the orthogonal complement of the null space of QI, um, which is not necessarily zero when QI is singular. And, and uh, so that's... Uh, in the matrix case, it's more complicated, you know, what the relationship, what the weighting is going on, okay? Um, what you can't, but this, this now gets a kind of the heart of the non-identification issue. You have the true AIs, the ones you want. You have what the regularization does. And so by comparing them in some way, you can, you can actually get at the idea or get at the, uh, some notion of, of how well identified your coefficients are that you're interested in, the average over all observation. So we're just going to use one simple way to do this, and there's probably better ones. We're just going to consider quantile plots of the ratio of the, um, uh, you know, the outer inner product of the of the norm of the ones that of uh, the regularized weights or linear combination coefficients over the true coefficients. And the idea here is like if this were the scalar case, you'd, you'd either get, uh, what, what you would get is these, be, these would be smaller than these for some observations, um, and maybe even zero, okay? But what you uh, get in general is gonna be more complicated than that. Okay, so, so um, that's what we're gonna do. This is gonna be our way, we're gonna plot this. We're just gonna give a quantile plot of this thing across the data, so you can see what proportion of observations you have where the, the actual regularized, the regularized weights depart from the ones that you want, okay? And so that allows you to look at the data and evaluate the event of non-identification condition, okay? So Graham and Powell considered average effects uh, only keeping, they did this regularization already in a different context, okay? They're not this regularization, but a different kind. They deleted observations where the determinant of QI was large enough. It's an interesting regularization too. Uh, this ridge regularization has a couple of nice properties. It's designed so to have this unbiasedness property, okay? When estimating average effects, um, it, it has this unbiased property, okay? And uh, that's a nice thing. And uh, also, we're doing it for an entirely different purpose. Uh, you know, we're doing it just to kind of think about uh, the identification and what's going on with the identification um, and to get some handle on that um, when uh, you, you possibly have the matrices that are close to singular and so the individual matrices. So it's a, it has a different purpose um, and to, uh, you know, what they did is they regularized when T, the number of time periods was equal to the number of, of uh, regressors, and we, with continuous regressors, that helps regularize the estimates so it's consistent and asymptotically normal. Our interest is to allow discreteness in the regressors while bypassing the partial identification, okay, and being able to assess the extent of identification in applications. Okay, consumer demand. I have like, what do I have? I've got like uh, 10 minutes? Nine, eight. 15. Oh, 15 minutes, okay. Okay, 
Um, okay, so we're going to use scanner data. Simple thing, you know, I mean, not, not simple, but uh, it's demand estimation, okay? Um, we, it's so you can think, you can use that to get estimates, estimates of the welfare effect of taxes. It's commonly done, okay? Uh, what's a little different and kind of back, you know, harks back to demand practice from was more common some years ago is we're going to model demand at an intermediate level of multi-stage budgeting, okay? And that's a demand for a type of good in a bundle, bundle of multiple types, okay? So think of uh, conditions under which that works. Uh, you know, Deaton and Mulbauer talk about that. There's a whole literature on separability. And uh, imposing separability is a common thing to do in practice, right? We always impose separability between the labor supply and the grocery consumption decision, and between you know intertemporal and labor supply and the grocery decision. So uh, you know we're just imposing a little more across a, uh, a particular bundle of goods. Okay. So uh, and as a way to think about, suppose you want to think about the effect of a tax on soda, right? And there's a paper about this in the AER not long ago. It seems like a reasonable thing to group goods where, you know, soda is one of the groups, right? And think about the effect of taxes on that group of goods. So that's what we do. Okay. And uh, so that's our motivation for that. Okay. Um, all right. We use the Nielsen scanner data. The usual, um, you all read it by now, right? So <laughs> that's a disclaimer about that, uh, it's uh, our own work. And uh, its data is 2007 and 2014. We strict our analysis to 2864 households included for at least 12 months. We model monthly expenditure. We construct price indices based on monthly total expenditure per good type and on the quantity purchased per month. We looked at 15 good types. Here they are, soda milk and the rest. And uh, same group types as uh, Berta and Hausman did in a couple of papers on, on, uh, on estimating demand. Uh, the price index is a weighted geometric average of the actual purchase price. That's a, tor a Tornquist uh, price index and uh, it has second order properties, uh, uh, good properties, okay? Uh, Deaton Mulbauer showed that in some uh, parametric demand specifications, this is the thing that you want, as long as you also have uh, uh, prices tending to move together as prices shift, okay, within a, within a good category, okay. And uh, now uh, the other thing we do is we include the zero expenditures, as I said, you know, we're just going to include those. That's the way we account for zeros. That's fine for these welfare calculations. Uh, house, houseman and, and uh, I figured it out, uh, you know, a while ago. So that's fine. But, you know, if it's zero purchases of a good, what price do you use? So what we do is we use a lag price if that's available. And if not, we use, uh, uh, if it's never purchased prior to a given month, in which case it's imputed price as the average price of, from nearby stores where purchases are made. Uh, we checked for differences in results between using all households and the selected, and that didn't matter for the, for the fixed effects elasticities. We check time stationary by comparing fixed effects and uh, elasticities with and without time dummies. And that didn't uh, affect things. So just to be safe, we, we took out the range of the data that covered the Great Recession uh, uh, and just looked at 2010 to 2014. Um, and then we also focused on milk and soda because uh, they had fewer zeros. If there are a lot of zeros, you worry that there's some intertemporal decisions going on with the household about uh, when they buy goods. And so we don't, uh, we're not allowing for those intertemporal decisions in what we're doing here. Um, okay, so as I said, uh, this is what I said, that if you check warp household by household in this data over that date range, it's rejected 95%. 
uh, by 95, you know, 95 percent of the people don't satisfy the weak axiom of preference. If instead you just look at an individual specific demand function with small amounts of regularization so that you don't have that shrinkage towards minus one uh, very, being very important, then you get that only 1.5% one, 1. for soda and 2.3% for milk would reject a one-sided test of a downward sloping demand. So the data is quite consistent with downward sloping demand for all individuals. Um, okay, so, oh, can, is, can I? I'm sorry about this. Is there some way to turn it full screen? Sorry about this. Okay, just, uh, this is soda consumer surplus linear. Let me just say a couple of things about it. This is the smallest value of the uh, regularization parameter we use in uh, the lambda. And a couple of things. This is, uh, we do it weighted by upper and lower income groups. And this is overall. Uh, not, a, not much effective regularization on these um, equivalent variation estimates, average equivalent variation of estimates. So. So, you know, for that, maybe fixed effects would be okay, turns out, looks like it, maybe. Um, the other thing you see is that, I won't do it, but when you go to linear, quadratic, and cubic, uh, where what we're doing is we're adding a linear, a quadratic and cubic full interactions uh, for the own price and total expenditure, it doesn't change the estimates at all, okay? So it doesn't change, there's, you know, they're not significantly different, they're just not different at all, so. Okay, yeah. So, so uh, dead weight loss is a little different. Um, that's the summary. Why don't I just leave it at that uh, for this, actually? Okay, so let's, let me just go on to then. Um, perfect. Okay, so let me just go on then to the, the Q plots of what you have here. Okay, so there's the dead weight loss for soda. Okay, and you can see it's fine. Leave it. That's fine. Oh, okay. Never mind. Thanks. <laughs> and you can see it's pretty close to ones everywhere, but it's not quite. So you might worry about some non-identification here uh, on the edges. And as I said, you don't always get shrinkage uh, here of the estimated effects. Okay. So let me look at uh, yeah, similar thing for milk. Yeah, similar thing for milk, but then when you look at the consumer surplus, it's flat. Okay, so, you know, there's no evidence of any here of non-identification at all in this data that you get. Uh, here, you know, the, the regularized coefficients are very similar to the, to the unregularized ones. Okay, so that's that application. Okay, so now I've got a couple more minutes, and I'll just go on to the last application. Okay, tax, heter, heterogeneous taxable income elasticity. Again, it's a regression, uh, just individual by individual with these interesting uh, budget set related variables that go in it. And again, as a particular assumption for utility function gives you this. And um, time trend allows for individual specific productivity growth. The data is the PSID and we report results in the following table and graph. And what you get, okay, back one, thanks. Let me go back. Okay, so that's the, that's the plot, right? That's the plot of, the, of these weights. And there are some things on the end, right? So the weights go a little crazy on that end and they go crazy on that end. But if you, if you look at the number of weights where you're far away, it's like, you know, less than 1% of the data. So I'm, I'm, 
we were a bit surprised by this because this is from the PSID, and so you know you're you're basically relying on uh, shifting shape of the tax taxes to identify the uh, effect, and yet you find that over you know very many observations you get essentially uh, the same regularized coefficients as you get um, for true coefficients. So um, so that's great. And then what do you get? Sorry, Yvonne. <laughs> One more time. Oh, okay. So, so um, there you go. Perfect. So here's what you get for the uh, debias slope elasticities. So these are average elasticities, allowing for uh, completely heterogeneous heterogeneous across people. Um, um, uh, Taxable income elasticities, right? And uh, they're, they're uh, you know, for the medium range, they are significant, and they're in a range that people have. The average looks a bit like what you get now uh, from estimates, in IV type estimates, uh, over the intermediate range here. Um, it's a little, you know, it's less than one. Pretty, pretty. Uh, you know, significantly less than one for uh, some cases once you get down here. I mean, you really want lambda to be quite small, so, you know, not so significantly less than one. And here, you know, allowing the heterogeneity is, makes a difference. You know, it's 0 0.80 approximately here, and down here is 1.1. So it shrinks the elasticity, uh, the average elasticity a lot by when you just do the fixed effects estimate versus allowing for heterogeneity. So it looks like heterogeneity of uh, taxable income elasticities is potentially important. And, uh, you know, we can do other things like this. Like one of the things that we want to do is look at the covariance of, of a non-labor income with a taxable income elasticity. Okay, so we're going to do that. Well, I'm going to stop here. There's just one more slide. Let me do that. And... Uh, just do the summary. So what we give linear estimators of structural and causal effects and non-separable panel data. Their estimators are based on linear random coefficients approximations to non-separable models. And via regularization, these estimators bypass partial identification when there are many time periods. And most importantly, of course, is knowing in your data whether this rank condition is, you know, how well it's satisfied. And so having these uh, regularized and non-regularized linear combination coefficients and comparing them is a good thing to do. And we find little sensitivity of the results uh, in the demand uh, model to the degree of approximation. You know, the quadratic and cubic, they give basically the same thing as the linear does. So the linear approximation actually works pretty good there. And, uh, and we also find little, uh, right, and we have also, oh, I didn't give that slide, uh, but we have large sample theory, too, for the, we skipped over that, but we have large sample theory, too, for both the case where you have a binary regressor and for the case where you have continuous regressors. So that's my summary. Thanks. Um, so here you're modeling the heterogeneity in a very unrestricted way, and then you use shrinkage kind of to deal with, with the fact that it's hard to estimate all of it. You could also try to use kind of mixture distributions or sort of group the heterogeneity kind of the way Stefan Bonhomme and Elena Manreza have done in, in similar settings. Kind of how do you see the, the advantages of kind of putting the shrinkage structure on in combination with with no limitations on the on the heterogeneity yeah that's a good question actually so the thing that we're relying on that that does in is smoothness and I you know the hope 
that, that I have at least is that if you use the smoothness like we're doing here in the approximation that you might save a lot because those can be pretty high dimensional uh, problems that they're doing a lot of times right and so um, I like uh, that's kind of the, uh, the the thinking is relying on the smoothness you might be able to make some progress and get something that's actually more parsimonious than than allowing for the mixture. The mixture is good and it has a lot of appeal, thinking about different types and so on, but, but uh, this, you know, this relies on the smoothness and hopeful it will help. Hopefully that will help. Great question.